We're going to have a cheeky um, Q&A with some questions that people have submitted already before time. Our first question is for Eliza on ensuring authentic representation. Eliza, how can we encourage more disabled characters in books that are not primarily about disability? And why is that important for young readers? Um, yeah, I think it's very important. I think that, uh, I think both are important. It's important to have stories that speak about disability um, for the reasons that I brought up in, in regards to, you know, having that representation for people with disability, but also um, enabling conversations to start in the home for uh, families that don't have disability. Uh, but I think it's also important just to have characters that, um, you know, where you don't focus on disability necessarily because we are, you know, humans that live interesting, unique lives that, um, you know, I love lots of things. So I think it's important to to show that. And I guess for me, when I think about my songwriting, I, you know, write songs about all different things. I write songs about different characters. Um, I write songs about love, relationships, memories, childhood, um, as well as disability. So I think that it just enables people to um relate more to understand that when you have a disability it's not you know it doesn't it, it make your whole life <laughs> it doesn't uh, affect everything necessarily uh and that we you know live lives just like anybody else and have relationships and think about all the things that we all think about so I think that that's really important to show that and so that we just explore that and are relatable Ezra speaking. Thanks for that answer, Eliza. I really appreciate it. I love bringing depth to disabled people in your music too is awesome. Okay. The next question that has been submitted from a participant before this webinar is for Laura. And that question is, how do authors honor diversity and inclusion, particularly when they are not writing from lived experience? What are the best practices to follow? Laura speaking. Um, thanks, Ezra. Um, well, I think one of the things that is most important, there are a couple of things that stand out to me. The first thing that you can and should do is read books by disabled writers um, in the genre and uh, area that you're going to write in. Um, and there are so many of them. Um, I'll send through a list afterwards, but that's the best way to kind of see how other writers have done it and how other writers have done it in a really sensitive way. Um, the other thing to think about is that um, if you don't have lived experience and you want to include um, a character with disability and maybe you're not or another marginalization and you're not comfortable having them as your protagonist or your main character or your narrator, like the person that the like that the book is from their point of view, um, you could have the character with the disability as a supporting character. Um, and one book that has done that really well is a recent middle grade book called How to Write the Soundtrack of Your Life by uh, Fiona Hardy. Um, I will like uh, shout that book from the rooftops. Um, beautiful. Um, there's a supporting character who has a wheel, uh, who is a wheelchair user um, and that was done really well. Um, but another important thing to do is to use a sensitivity reader. So um, a sensitivity reader is um, someone who is part of your target audience, um, but also in particular, um, actually has lived experience of the marginalization that you're writing about. So you might often hear the term beta reader, um, and that's kind of similar, um, but beta reader just means that the person is from your target audience. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have lived experience of a particular marginalization or that they would be able to comment on the accuracy of the representation of that group when they read your book. Um, and if you do, when you do engage a sensitivity reader, um, it's really important to pay them for their time and their expertise. Um, because as we know, disabled people so often um, are asked to do things and share our expertise for free. Um, and enough of that, thank you. Um, and if you're looking for a uh, sensitivity reader, a good place to start would be the Australian Society of Authors website. Um, they actually have a database of all their sensitivity readers with a list of um, I guess what like genres they read and what lived experience they bring. 
um, uh, like my hand is up, I'm on there. So if anyone's writing a book about cerebral palsy, like I'm so ready to read it. Um, but yeah, super important to uh, engage with sensitivity readers, um, not just one, if you can, because um, you know, if you've met one disabled person, you've met one disabled person. Um, and we all have, as all of the other panelists have so beautifully articulated, um, very diverse experiences. Um, and seeking the input of as many disabled people as you can, um, or as many people from the particular marginalization as you can is really important. Thanks. As you're speaking, thanks, Laura. That was such an informative response. I will have to check out how to write the soundtrack of your life. Definitely need to go to the library after this experience and get about a thousand books out. Um, my next question from a participant is for Chloe. Chloe, based on your research, how can we get more varied and less stereotypical representation of autism into books, such as including sensory seekers instead of just sensory avoiders? Chloe speaking, um, that's such a great question. I think it really speaks to the need of having um, that diverse representation that we've all talked about. Um, as Laura said, if you've met one disabled person, you've met one disabled person. If you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, so I think I think there's things that publishers can do, writers can do, and then also readers can do as well. So what I've seen in my research on film and television is that generally as the writer's room or the behind the scenes gets more diverse, so do the stories. Um, kind of how like how Eliza was saying before, like there used to be sort of not really any representation on TV for us now as people get those opportunities, it does become more diverse. Um, so for this specific example, for publishers, I'd re recommend working with um, autistic authors across the autism spectrum. Um, and if engaging with sensitivity readers, um, engage with readers whose life experiences are different from each other. So not just one autistic person, but a whole variety of autistic people. Um, so this sometimes means you have to be like quite specific, like you want um, readers who are autistic and female and around this age and this ethnicity or whatever um, to get those different perspectives. Um, for writers, whether autistic or not autistic, um, I'd recommend just like continuous education about the different ways people can be autistic, um, engaging with diverse reviewers, um, and trying to write characters who aren't just one thing, like that's not, oh, that's the autistic character and that's their whole personality. Um, like obviously disability or autism is a massive part of who we are, but it's not everything. Um, and I think that kind of complexity and that nuance for characters is really important. Um, and then for readers, um, again, I think showing libraries or bookshops or publishers that there is a demand for these sort of stories is useful. Um, so you could borrow these from your library, recommend them to your library if you know of examples, um, or if you can't really find any examples, you could write to publishers or authors um, who might be willing to take on your recommendations. So yeah, your feedback matters when it comes to representation. As you're speaking, thanks for sharing that, Chloe. I really appreciate your advice. Our next question is for Tiana, our host with the most. Tiana, you read using Braille and audiobooks. How important is it to make sure that these types of media are used more, more available, and frankly, better understood as a legitimate and commercial product? What steps can we take to make this a reality? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ezra. I think uh, to link back first to something that you said before, uh, you said that after this webinar, you're going to go to the library and you're going to get all these books and you're going to read them. That's a reality for everyone who can see. But for me and for blind people as a whole, for people who read with Braille and audiobooks, it's not a reality. Um, we can't just go to the library and be like, oh, let me just get like 10 books about this topic and then go home and read them all and and then return them and get 10 more and then get 10 more. Like that's not something that we can do. And with services like Audible becoming more mainstream, um, it's becoming easier, but also it comes at a at a price for us. <laughs> Audible is not a it's not a free service; um, it's a paid service. So it means that if you know every book that I want to buy, 
or listen to, I have to buy. Um, uh, there are libraries that offer free audiobooks, which is great, and we're moving in the right direction. Um, but Braille especially is being left in the past, and I think it really needs to be understood that it is a commercial product and that it is an important product in um, the lives of people who are blind or vision impaired, especially people who were raised in my generation specifically. Uh, I know future generations of blind children are being raised more on audio content than on Braille. Um, and I would like to try, you know, I think it's very, very important that we make sure that Braille doesn't die. <laughs> and that's another topic uh, completely. But I just, yeah, I think that people really need to understand that for a blind person, Braille is like reading in print or like picking up a paper book and reading it. Whereas audio content for me is like picking up a Kindle and reading on a screen. It's it's a similar thing, but it's not the same. And it's becoming more and more difficult to find. So I think it's just so important that, um, that authors and publishers are linked with services that can provide Braille embossing and that can provide Braille books in their libraries. At the moment, we've got Vision Australia and Braille House are the two main providers of Braille. Um, so if you're an author, it's always very, very helpful for you to get in contact with those services and get your books printed out and in the two main libraries. Um, but yeah, I just think it's, people need to understand that it, it's not, it's very, very important. Braille is so important for blind people and it's not dying like the the common misconception is today. <laughs> so thank you so much for that question. As you're speaking, thank you for that super informative answer. Um, Braille is so important, and I'm going to go to my library and ask them if they have a Braille section as well. They will not have a Braille section. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, uh, a shame, a shame. But um, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and telling us the importance of keeping Braille alive. We are definitely over time, which is not a bad thing because it shows how passionate everyone is about this topic. Um, the last question I guess we have time for is for Lily. And Lily, the question is, um, what do you wish more children knew about children with disability? What do you want to see happen now? Okay, so first of all, when I first saw that this was the question, I was like so happy because this is like the perfect question for me. I would have a lot of things that I would want. But um, first of all, I would want like definitely this, people to stop asking what's wrong with your leg, what's on your leg, why are you like have that like I don't want that asked anymore because it's so annoying. I go to the shops, I go to school, I go anywhere. And that's all people ask me. It's not just children either. Even adults are like going and, oh, what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. Like it's it's like so annoying. I would definitely want people to stop realising it's not a bad thing. Nothing's wrong with me. You can stop acting like that because it's really, really annoying. And how can people um, sleep with that? Um, yeah, and I think that like, um, yeah, if like more shows and books – Probably shows because, like, it's not guaranteed people are going to read the books anyway, but a lot of people would, like, watch shows and stuff that, like, um, showcasing, like, things like cerebral palsy, people in wheelchairs and other sort of things. There's nothing wrong with them, and you can stop asking all these questions because it's just, like, so annoying. That's probably, like, the number one thing I want to happen and the number one thing that I, like, hate about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that response, Lily. I completely agree. Constantly being asked questions is annoying. Um, I think we don't have much time left, but I do have a master doc of all the questions. We have received quite a lot um, before this event, also during the event, and I will send those through to the panelists tomorrow. Um, thank you all for your insightful answers to the questions and for engaging in this important discussion. It's very clear about the power of books and representation and how it can make a huge difference in the lives of all people with disabilities, but especially young people.
I want to again send a heartfelt thanks um, to our wonderful panelists, Eliza, Lily, Tiana, Laura, and Chloe. Your expertise and perspectives have enriched our conversations tonight, and I've really enjoyed learning from you all. Thank you all to our audience for your thoughtful questions throughout and for your active participation. Um, your engagement makes these discussions so won wonderful and valuable, and it's clear that we need more spaces like this going forward, seeing that we have grown over time. Um, I'm going to hand back to Tiana for a final wrap up. Thank you again. Tiana, over to you. Thank you so, so much, Ezra, for uh, moderating that wonderful panel discussion. And thank you guys for allowing me to be part of the panel. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to Chloe, Laura, um, Lily, and Eliza for being my fellow panelists today. Um, and yeah, thank you to the Auslan interpreters and thank you to the, the caption providers today. Uh, we've had a fantastic discussion about power in books and the importance of authentic representation of people with disabilities um, in literature, specifically in children's literature, although it does apply in all literature. Um, and we have definitely explored how stories can shape perceptions, how they can foster empathy and how they can help young people with disability to see themselves in the books that they read. Uh, we have also discussed the roles of advocates and families and educators in providing these books to children. As we wrap up, it's so clear that we all have a role to play in making sure that literature, uh, that literature is inclusive and representative of people with disability, whether they are writers, whether we are writers, educators, parents, or uh, or advocates, our actions make a huge difference, make a really significant difference in ensuring that our children feel seen and valued in our society. Uh, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers today and all of our moderators, um, Ezra, Eliza, Lily, uh, Laura, Chloe, just everyone, you've been absolutely amazing. Uh, your dedication and passion for this cause is incredible. Uh, if anyone has any further questions or needs support, please remember that our safety and wellbeing officer, Liz, is available to assist after this event. Don't hesitate to reach out to her uh, for any concerns or any follow-up questions. We have a wealth of resources uh, to send to you guys after this webinar, including links to accessible literature. And I think many, many resources have been added to that list during tonight. So they will definitely be uh, collated and they will also be sent to you guys. Um, we have advocacy groups. Um, uh, they will all be shared and any way that you guys can get involved will be shared after this webinar. So please, please keep an eye on your email. Uh, we definitely encourage you guys to take the information that you, the information and the insight that you guys gained today and to use it to your advantage, to use it in your communities and make sure that inclusive and representative uh, literature is in the communities that you are a part of. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Your participation and engagement have been absolutely invaluable. Let's continue to champion the power of books and representation for all. Have a wonderful evening and goodbye. Thank you all so much. Thanks everyone, bye.